Hi, my name is Dr. Owen Redwood, and this lecture is a bonus lecture part of the Offensive Computer Security 2.0 Open Courseware. This lecture is a guest lecture presented by Dr. Devin Cook, a friend of mine and colleague, and he is presenting in this lecture a brief history of exploitation. Enjoy. So, all right, um, cool. So this is Devin Cook. I met him at Sandia National Labs. We had an internship together. It was a lot of fun, a lot of adventuring in San Francisco and California, <laughs> getting lost, ending up homeless, and fun stories <laughs> and happy stuff. How do I, let's see here. Uh -huh. Here we go. That's what I was looking for. All right, yeah, so um, so originally, uh, Owen had wanted me to come and talk about uh, ROP, um, and it sounded like he, I watched his video from last week, and it sounded like he did a pretty good job. So um, what I decided to do was to kind of give you more like a, a brief overview, and then we'll hit on ROP again, and then we'll talk about what's coming up next as well. Um, so yeah, so like you said, my name is uh, Devin Cook. I'm a PhD student at Auburn, um, and hoping to finish up this this summer. Maybe we'll see if I can get all my research done. But um, but yeah, so um, so really, security is uh, kind of a, a cat and mouse game, right? So you've got uh, attackers and defenders, and um, it's really like an arms race, basically, where the defenders are trying to keep everything secure, the attackers are trying to get in, um, and there's there's a back and forth that goes along. Um, and often, like, the defensive side is, is quite often reactionary. So because a new attack is discovered, well, then they decide, well, we should probably do something to prevent this. Um, and then once that that defense is in place... Um, then people start looking at it and they go, oh, well, I mean, we can circumvent that so-and-so way. So that's what we're going to be talking about today is kind of this back and forth um, of binary execution, uh, binary exploitation. <clears throat> um, so yeah, so we're going to talk today about uh, kind of these older uh, exploit mitigations, they're called. Um, so like stack canaries and stack exception handling, uh, and then the ways to get around those. Um, and we'll talk about the DEP, data execution prevention, um, which basically just makes it so that you can't run normal shell code. Um, and of course, you know we have ways of getting around that. Um, and then we'll kind of close up talking about ASLR, uh, and then the ways to, to beat ASLR. Um, so can anybody think of any other examples of, um, of kind of, of mitigations and then the security community's response to them? Um, so this is not, like, not limited to, to binaries, like even physical security or web security. Like, can you guys think of any, um, you know, what's, what's a typical attack vector and then how, how is that mitigated? So like web, for instance. Do you have captures defeated? You know, bots just brute forcing captures all the time. Yes, thank you, Owen. So, uh, <laughs> um, yeah. So, like for instance, um, if you have uh, you have a website and you want to make sure that it's not being hit with automated bots and tools, um, you might put a captcha on it. And of course, then the answer to that is, well, I mean, we can have bots do these CAPTCHAs. Or uh, has anybody heard of the Mechanical Turk? A couple of people. So Amazon has this service where you can basically um, break a task down into very simple jobs. Um, and then you uh, put that on the Me Mechanical Turk. And then people around the world can come and do those simple tasks and get paid by you. Um, so you can say, you know, for five cents, uh, I, I want you to tell me what this image says in the text. Um, so they do that, and then you take it and you plug it into your CAPTCHA. So it's like simple uh, automation that uses people. Um, okay, so uh, any other examples? So what about, like, physical security? 
sort out like Lux. Yeah. I was wondering why it had to be like early facial recognition software to put a picture up to it. Right, yeah, that's a great example. So um, I think they were, uh, like Japan was doing, they had these vending machines, they were selling alcohol, um, and you could just hold a magazine photo up to the, the camera on the vending machine, uh, and it would say, oh, yeah, you're over 21, here's your beer. Um, so yeah, that's that's a good example. So I mean, also like locks and lock picking. Like there's always always going to be um, a back and forth of like, well, here's we're going to do this to keep people out, and then the attackers have to come up with you know ways to get around it. Or um, you think like DVD ripping, like lib DVD CSS, um, which is a content scrambling system for DVDs. Uh, I mean. Hackers eventually were able to figure that out. Now we can still rip DVDs like we used to be able to. We just have to jump through some extra hoops. Um, all right. Uh, so let's go way back to the old days, the wild, wild west of binaries, right? Um, things used to be super easy for us. Uh, this is, here's a stack frame, okay? Um, and hopefully everybody is familiar with what a stack frame looks like. Um, and you guys have done a little bit of exploitation stuff already. Um, okay, so this is just one, you know, one stack frame on a stack. Uh, and you can see on the left side, um, that's the top of the stack, all right? And you've got uh, local variables to that particular function call that you're in. Um, you have, you know, maybe some saved, uh, saved registers like EBP, you know, your saved stack pointer. Um, and then your return uh, instructions or wherever you came from, and then you have the arguments or parameters. Um, now, of course, this is uh, specific to CDECL, which is what you guys have been talking about already, which is the, um, the calling convention, um, which says that you push the parameters uh, or arguments onto the stack in reverse order, um, and then you push the, um, the return address here, your instruction pointer. All right. Um, okay. Now, how can we exploit this? Uh, well, so if you look here, um, if you don't have proper bounds checking on your buffer, uh, then it's you know you can just continue writing along here and smash the stack. Um, is what uh, what they call it. So. So if you can write in any arbitrary data that you give to the program into memory, um, you can overwrite stuff. Uh, this gives you, you know, a lot of power here because you can, um, this particular slot in the stack frame, um, that controls what is executing. Um, if you can overwrite that, then you can tell the program to start executing some other data. All right. Um, and if we can, if we have enough space in here to fit some shell code, just some date, some uh, commands that we've handpicked and put together, um, then we're able to just have it return right into our shell code and start executing that um, as the next instruction. Okay. Now, um, so what? Why is this possible? What What makes this possible? Go ahead. Right. Yeah. So um, string processing you mentioned, um, which is you know if you're using any of this the old string functions, um, you know string copy, uh, and then you know like string cat, all of those. They, uh, you don't have to specify a length for them. They just run until they run into a null byte because strings are always null terminated, of course. So, um, so why would anybody ever abuse that? Well, um, you know, as it turns out, uh, you know, a lot of these software paradigms that we use nowadays, um, like email is a great example, it was just not designed with security in mind at all. Um, when people design these protocols and these, um, you know, these particular uh, processes, um, you know, they weren't really thinking, how, how could somebody abuse this? Um, 
because really they had like a limited audience back in the day. Um, only people with fairly good intentions had access to the networks. Um, but nowadays, uh, it's open to everybody, and there are all kinds of people that have access. So, um, so yeah, so we can do this because of how the stack frame is laid out, um, and because of how all of our functions work that we use on a day-to-day -day basis in the libraries. Um, okay, so, um, so I mean, how can we, what are some ways that we can keep this from happening? We already kind of hinted at this, um, but like what, what would be a very simple thing to do here um, that would stop this particular type of attack? Yeah, a token. Um, so what, what do you mean by a token? Yeah, so, right, a stack cookie. So basically, um, what that means is you could, um, okay, so or it's also called a stack canary. Um, basically, you can insert a field in a stack frame um, where you put in some kind of, uh, some kind of token, some kind of number, um, and you run, you execute your program, and then before you return, you verify that that token is the same as it was when you started. Okay, um, so that means that if this changes at all, if this is overwritten, then you know that you've had a buffer overflow, and you know that um, that there's been some kind of corruption of your stack. All right. Um, now, when you do this, uh, it makes it very hard to overwrite the return address here. Um, you're not able to just do a standard buffer overflow where you, you know, start writing into your buffer um, and keep going past the end of the buffer, overwriting the, you know, EDP in your return instruction um, or your return address. Excuse me. Um, now, how can we how can we get around this? Well, uh, if it depends on if we're on. Um, uh, so if we're doing it locally, like we could probably brute force it, um, although depending on the size of this cookie um, or stack canary, um, it, can, it can take a very long time. It's not usually feasible to do that. A uh, better strategy is basically to use that buffer overflow that you originally found um, just to overwrite this section here, just overwrite local variables. Um, now, why does that work? Well. These local variables, um, you know, there are usually if statements, loops, things that are relying on these variables um, to guide the, the execution path through the program. So if we have control over these, then we can often control the execution path of the program without directly controlling um, the return address of the function. Okay, so, um, so this is kind of... Uh, it makes it, it definitely makes it much more difficult because you have to not just find a buffer overflow and exploit it, um, but you have to figure out some way that you can use that to gain uh, what's called arbitrary code execution. You want to be able to be executing your own code, right? Um, so one example is if there are some function pointers um, that we can possibly overwrite. Uh, then we can overwrite those function pointers to point into shell code or to point somewhere else that we want them to go. Um, yes. So in, in your binary, where can you find uh, maybe a table of functions? Yeah, the got, right? So, um, so there's a section in the binary um, where they store all of these. It's like a you know a lookup table basically um, for functions, um, and that's that's great. So if you can overwrite those, then you can when when those functions are called, instead of jumping to the function, it jumps to your code that you control, right? Now, um, some other interesting things you can do is uh, sometimes there are like local pointers stored. Um, and if you can overwrite those pointers, and then later on in that function, uh, if they do a uh, like a read or a write 
using that pointer, then you can control what's read or written. So that will sometimes give you arbitrary, uh, you'll be able to write to an arbitrary location in memory. Um, so that, that can sometimes be used, either to, um, sometimes you can use that to disclose information that's in memory, or you can use it to disclose, uh, disclose addresses, potentially. Um, you can use it to, um, to write data. So if, you have, if you're able to get an arbitrary write um, to, to anywhere in memory, um, and you can calculate what this return uh, value is, where, what the address of your, uh, your return address is, um, then you can overwrite that without smashing the canary. Um, and that will work as well. So uh, another thing to note is that this canary gets checked at the end when the function, right before the function is returning. Um, so if you need to smash the stack and smash the canary, um, then that's fine as long as you're not counting on it working when you go to return. Um, okay, so, um, and then of course, Windows has something called uh, stack exception handling, um, or sorry, structured, uh, so I guess it's interesting, they're called structured exception handling sometimes. Um, and this is Windows specific, but the way that it works is in your stack frame here, so this is another, uh, another stack frame, um, they uh, store little bits of code here um, that tell it what to do when an exception is received. All right, now um, I think that Linux typically handles this with interrupts, but I'm not 100% sure how it works. Um, <clears throat> But essentially the gist of it is uh, you can smash this uh, SEH bit um, and overwrite it with arbitrary data and then trigger an, some kind of exception and then it's going to jump into the, um, the exception handler. Yeah. Um, so when you want to exploit it, uh, what you can do is you can come in and you can start, you know, start your buffer overflow. You start writing your, your junk to the buffer. Um, <clears throat> and you can overwrite uh, the current exception handler as well as the pointer to the next one. Um, and what you can do is you can just have, uh, you can write some simple code in here that just does a pop pop ret. Um, because when the exception handler is triggered, um, it actually sets up some stuff on the stack. Um, there's like a new frame added essentially. Uh, so if you, uh, when it jumps into this, if you've overwritten it with just pop pop ret, um, then it just removes that stuff that just got added um, and returns. Um, right, and it jumps then to, uh, to this next uh, exception handler because if you return from the exception handler that means that you weren't able to handle the exception it has to go to the next one it's a linked list like Owen said um, all right so great so we jump here and we've overwritten this with a pointer to our shellcode somewhere in memory right um, so then execution will continue at our shellcode with code that we control all right does everybody understand that all right um, but yeah, like Owen said, uh, this is something that used to be super awesome and useful, but now um, a lot of the Windows defenses are getting better and better. Um, so Emmet, I right, forget exactly what it stands for, there's something mitigation. Mitigation, mitigation experience toolkit. Yeah, it's exploit, exploit mitigation, there's, uh, yeah. But anyway, so it's, it's a toolkit for Windows that enables all of these security features that we talk about, that you guys are, have talked about in this class and we'll talk about today. So it enables things like the no execute. Um, it enables the stack protection or stack cookies. 
Um, it uh, it does ASLR. Uh, <coughs> right, yeah, a bunch. All right. Um, so basically, the key for this is you used to be able to um, to cause an exception, jump into this exception handling routine that you've overwritten already, <coughs> and be able to use that to um, to gain code execution somewhere else. All right. Now. Um, all or most of the attacks that you guys have talked about so far <clears throat> in the course have been uh, using your shell code. Um, now, how, how exactly does shell code work? So you've got this, these commands, these, like this machine code that you've put together, and it's sitting somewhere in your stack, right? Um, now, what is normally stored in a stack? Like, what do you normally have there? What's in a stack frame? So we just showed some pictures of that. Yeah, data. What kind of data? Local variables, arguments. Okay, good. Return addresses, like, you know, save stuff. Like, there should never be any executable code in there. Um, so if that, I mean, if that's the case and you have a rule that there's never any executable code, um, then why don't you go ahead and enforce that? So that's what dep um, and the nx or no execute bit um, means. And so this is supported uh, at a, a low level, um, like hardware level, uh, and it basically just makes it so that uh, any address um, in the range of the stack cannot be in the instruction pointer. You can't execute any of uh, any of the data in there. It's um, it's the you know basically you say I never want to run any of this. This is always just going to be data separation of code and data, right? So um, and this separation of code and data occurs other places as well. So think about like um, SQL injection, for example, or really in general just command injection. So command injection is a type of attack uh, that happens because you confuse uh, data and code, okay? So like user supplied data gets treated somehow as executable code, um, and that's bad. You never want to do that. So for example, um, you want to use things like, uh, like prepared statements for SQL um, that that make it so that you cannot have SQL injection. Um, or you want to do, you know, make sure you're doing all of the sanitization of user input um, so that you can't have command injection. Um, so, for example, like if, uh, if, you're, running, uh, if you're running a binary um, and it takes some user input and then passes that user input into a system call using some string manipulation, like that's, that's pretty shady. Um, because if you're able to, um, to, cons to make the command that's being executed look like some other command or look like multiple commands, um, then you can get it to run code that you want. Okay. Now, um, so this really applies to, um, to shell code specifically. Um, and this prevents us uh, from running anything stored on the stack. All right. Um, and m more than that, any memory that is marked as writable, any memory that you can change, uh, should not be executable. Um, so that, you know, draws a line and separates um, data and code. All right. Now, um, if there's still some way that we can get control of the instruction pointer, though, uh, like via a buff over buffer overflow, uh, can we still do anything with it? Yep. So we wouldn't, uh, you know, we would be pretty pretty screwed if we couldn't. So all right. Um, so here is uh, what a process memory space looks like. All right. So we've been talking about uh, mostly the stack. Okay. And the stack is just one small piece of all of the memory allocated to a process. Right. Um, so there's always uh, at one end, you've got the kernel space, okay, which is just um, 
various kernel functions and kernel data that you can't you can't ever read or write. Um, you can just you can call their functions that are exposed. Um, and reading or writing results in a segmentation fault, so it off that that crashes it. Um, so that's out. Uh, so we've been talking about the stack, and the stack is marked as not executable because um, that's bad. Um, let's see. So the heap. Everybody should know what the heap is. Hopefully, have you guys talked about heap sprays and heap overflows and all that? Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. So um, now the heap is a writable section of memory, though. So uh, also, you know, not allowed to execute code from there. So we can't just stick our shell code in the heap um, and execute that. Um, and then there's, uh, there are just various sections from your binary that get loaded into memory. So you've got the text segment, um, which is your, your actual code, right? Um, and then you've got the data segment that has like static variables, global variables, um, all of that. Uh, and then there's a lot of like unallocated space and then the memory mapping segment, all right? So this is what we're interested in, um, or one of the things that we're interested in. So, uh, so what, what might you map into memory um, for example? Libraries, right, good. So libraries, including libc, the big one. Like it's, libc is great. Um, it's about 2,000 subroutines. Um, so that's plenty of executable code for us to work with, right? Um, now, there's also the, uh, the text segment here. Um, so this is all of the code for our, our binary. Um, so, you know, maybe we can use something out of these. Now, remember, we can't write to these. These are, you know, executable, so we can't write to them. Uh, but there's, there's code in there, and we should be able to use that code because it's in our memory space. Um, so we should be able to jump to that, all right? Um, Okay, so basically the idea of return to libc attack um, is just you set your instruction pointer, your return address, to point into one of the libraries that's loaded. Um, and then once you do that, it'll start executing wherever you've pointed to. So it's, it basically acts like a function call. Okay. Um, all right. And... Uh, Return to libc is um, it's really easy if the function that you're trying to call doesn't expect any arguments. Um, because then you can just write the, uh, the address and it acts just like a call. It starts executing that function. However, um, you know, in order to do anything useful, you usually have to supply it with some arguments. Now, um, what, what's difficult about supplying it with arguments? Yeah. Right, good. Um, so yeah, so it expects those arguments um, at specific offsets. Um, now, the problem with that is that the top of our stack is still pointed up here. Um, so if it's looking at a specific offset, um, you know, so it's it's going to be looking right before where it expects the return um, address is. Okay, so it's probably going to be looking somewhere over here for that. Um, or actually, sorry. Uh, yeah, it'll be looking like over here for that. Okay, and um, what we what we end up having to do um, often is something called a stack pivot, where, which is where we create our own fake stack to use. All right. Um, so right now, the current frame pointer um, and stack pointer are pointing at the frame that we've just overwritten. We've just smashed it. Okay, now, if we want to make 
the offsets work correctly and we want to make it able to see arguments, um, we need to set up a new stack. Um, and then we need to figure out some kind of way to make, um, to make these pointers correct. We want them to point um, into the new stack. Now, uh, this new stack could exist um, oh, like on top of the frame that we've smashed. It could be somewhere in the heap. It doesn't really matter where it is. Um, all that matters is that it looks enough like a stack that this function will be able to run correctly and do what we want it to do. Okay. Um, all right. So, like, a, for instance, a really common uh, function call in libc that you'll use is like, um, like exec ve or something, which will cause it to start executing some other program. So, for example, uh, you could have it start executing, uh, start executing netcat. Um, which you know turns it into basically a remote shell for you that connects back to you, um, and you're able to remotely log into that machine. All right. Um, okay. So the problem though is how do we get these pointers to work correctly? Uh, well, there are a bunch of different ways. Um, the idea is we, we first we set up the stack. Okay, and we, that's usually done like you could do that in your buffer overflow step. Right, so you start writing all of your junk, you smash the stack, you write all the values of the new stack um, on top of it, uh, and then when it's time to return, um, you just have to find some commands that will, uh, that will set up the stack pointer. Um, so, for instance, if you can find an exchange um, opcode somewhere that is swapping two registers, um, or uh, for example, if you have um, like an add or an increment to the stack pointer, um, then we can repeat that several times to get the value that we want, to get it pointing at the correct location, um, or you know, or a move, or um, if we can somehow use a function prologue or epilogue, which is what happens either in the beginning of a function or the end, uh, because the stack is often modified there. Often things are pushed and popped. Um, at the beginning or ends of, of functions, okay? Um, okay, so just as an aside, um, so a couple of the ideas that people came up with for making this more difficult was, uh, well, if we remove functions from the libraries, then people won't be able to return into them. So basically, if, uh, if I know that my program is not using exec VE, then why have it available in memory? Okay, so um, so what actually the way that you would do this is you would take libc or whatever library, and um, you'd strip out the functions that you don't need, and then you'd link that resulting library with your your binary instead of the regular libc. Okay, um, so that still leaves all the functions that are available in our code uh, in the binary that that we're exploiting. Um, and it still uses it still leaves all of the functions that are left in the libraries. Okay, um, and a lot of applications can link, you know, a, a ton of different libraries. So, like most of most of the programs that you'll probably be playing with in here are going to be relatively simple, um, and most like they'll be linked with one or two libraries maybe. Um, in the real world, you'll find that there are often a lot of different libraries linked. Um, and it gives you a lot to choose from when you're doing this. Um, okay, so uh, so another thing we can try to do is make sure that the libraries, when they get mapped, they're going to be mapped somewhere in memory um, that uh, has a null byte in all of the addresses. So like some for like some low um, uh, low place in memory. All right, so that means. What, what's hard about that? Why, um, why does that make it more difficult if the addresses have null bytes? Right, so like if you're exploiting this with a typical buffer overflow and, they're, and you're exploiting the use of some unsafe string function, um, that means that it's going to, to stop copying when it runs into a null byte. All right, so, um, so that's bad. So null bytes... Um, the address space that contains a lot of null bytes is often called the ASCII armor region. Um, and ASCII armor can have different, uh, a couple of different meanings. Um, 
but one of them is this region in memory where you can map libraries that make it hard to, to uh, you know, to smash the stack and make it jump into those because of the null bytes, All right? Um, of course, uh, you know, like we said before, just having less functions available to call, um, you know, it doesn't prevent us from from taking little bits, uh, little bits of executable code and stringing them together, uh, which is what Owen talked about last week. Um, all right, so uh, so that is that that technique is called ROP, and we've actually already talked about this today. Um, when we were talking about the way to change the stack pointers, um, that is essentially ROP. So we find these small bits of code called gadgets, um, and we can string them together and have them execute one after another, and incrementally they get you know, small things done uh, that get us closer and closer to our goal. Okay, so, um, all right, and what's great about these is that uh, they don't really take any arguments. They often um, you can you can use ones that operate mainly on uh, registers. Um, so you can basically just write a bunch of return addresses in a row um, because all a ret does is basically do pop uh, you know pop eip. Um, so it just takes whatever's on top of the stack, sticks it in the instruction pointer, and continues executing. All right. So. Um, all right, so this chain uh, of ROP gadgets is often called a ROP chain, okay? And th this is just some examples of some very simple ROP gadgets. Um, you can use ones that are longer. Um, you can use ones that are NOPs just to fill space, or you can just write NOPs in. Um, you know, it, it depends on like what, uh, what bad characters you have. So for example, um, if you're trying to avoid null bytes because you're abusing some string copy function, um, then if any of these gadgets have uh, a null byte in the address, that makes them harder to use for us. Okay. Um, the good thing, though, is that these are all over the place. Um, just all over our binary. Yeah? So, must there be a template code that just ends up calling the functions? Like, the last thing we'll see. Yeah, and really all lib is is like a one or two pop, um, you know, pop commands. So is what that gets broken down into. Um, and then there's also like you know, uh, like push ad that sets all the flags at once. Like there are a lot of super useful little one or two opcode things that you can do. Um, there are also like uh, there are string manipulation um, opcodes in x86. Um, so like uh, like move sx. Uh, you know, sign extension things, and the, I mean, there's there's a lot that you can do um, with these. They're very powerful. X86 is ridiculous at what they're Right, right. Yeah. So um, another thing that Owen talked about last week uh, was that these um, basically each each gadget fits into a specific class. So for instance, um, there might be a, a class of gadgets that increments a register. So a bunch of different gadgets that do exactly the same thing. You only need one of them as long as the, you know, the address doesn't contain any null bytes or whatever, you know, whatever bad characters you, don't, you want to avoid. Um, and so the great thing is, once you have one from all of the available categories, I think there are like 40 something categories that you need, um, then it's actually a Turing complete language, which Owen talked about, and we'll talk about a little bit. So Turing completeness, uh, a few people in IRC had questions about what this is, we didn't have uh, CS backgrounds. Turing completeness is, without getting to a semester's worth of theory, it's really just a statement about the minimum capabilities of a set of instructions, or a machine or a state. It's basically a bar that's set, saying that with this, I can emulate other things that are Turing complete. Okay. Um, also, uh, do we go till what time? Four fifty. 
Okay. All right. So, um, okay. So yeah. So using ROP, um, we can do a lot of different things. It's very powerful. Um, now, just to reiterate what Owen said, um, in case the mic didn't pick it up, uh, Turing completeness uh, is basically just a, a measure of um, how uh, how powerful uh, a certain language is. If you're able to um, basically, if you're able to do anything with it, uh, then it's Turing complete. If it's limited to certain things, then it's not Turing complete. So, uh, so like one example is that uh, like um, uh, regular like actual computer science regular expressions, uh, not Perl regular expressions, um, are not Turing complete because they can't be used to describe uh, everything. You know, you 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 cannot use them to describe. Um, for instance, you can't use them to do like parentheses matching. Um, you need a context-sensitive grammar to do that instead, right? Okay, so um, so often with ROP, uh, the goal is to take um, to take a segment of memory um, and turn off that NX bit, make it executable again, so that you can run just regular shellcode. Because uh, while ROP is very powerful, um, it's also a royal pain sometimes. Um, because you have to go hunting for all these gadgets, and then you have to string them all together. It's basically like you have to, you know, with shellcode, you have to write your own um, assembly code, or at, at least C code, and then have it translated into assembly code. Um, with ROP, you've got existing pieces of assembly code um, that you have to somehow work with and string together to make it do something useful. Um, now, uh, that said, like, um, it's pretty easy to make it just to, to set up a stack and then call one function. All right, so often uh, what an attacker will do is they'll just change a segment of memory to be executable again. Uh, that segment has your shell code, and you just jump into it and start executing, and it's, you know, back like the old days. Um, so you have your, your executable bit of memory. Um, okay, so yeah, so you can also do things like change file descriptors. Um, you can like use the, the dupe2 in Linux to, um, to, to mess with pipes and stuff. Um, so I know, how many of you guys play uh, CTFs? Um, anybody? A couple of people have done CTFs. So like one thing that's really common uh, for exploits there is to um, you know, to, to change the output pipe um, so that, you know, instead of going out the socket, it's going to a file or something like that. Um, or so, the reverse. Yeah, or the reverse. Instead of writing to standard error, it writes to your socket that you're reading, something like that. Um, okay, so, uh, all right, so with ROP, basically, um, like we said before, these instructions can exist anywhere in executable memory. So that means they're either in the process mapping, uh, or sorry, the library mapping space that has all the libraries loaded, or they're in your, you know, where your program's binary, the text segment that got loaded into memory. Um, so you just jump around uh, in code, getting it to, you know, getting you incrementally closer to your, your stated goal, all right? So let's look at um, an example of that. Um, all right, so imagine we have these three ROP gadgets, okay? Um, now this is AT&T uh, AT uh, dialect, but <laughs> yeah, it, it, I find it pretty obnoxious too, but I don't think it really matters for this example. So, um, all right, so we've got like an XOR here. Um, so what, is, what does this do, this XOR? Yeah, okay, good. So it's zeroing out the EAX register, right? And then it returns. Um, so yeah, you'll notice that like all the gadgets, of course, they end in return because you want them to jump back and then you specify the next one as the return address. Hence, return oriented programming. Yes. There's another field called jump oriented programming and then probably call oriented programming. And it all really just has to do with reuse 
so gradually. I think that targeting things that allow you to jump around more favorable gadgets. Yeah. Yeah, and as we'll see in a minute, like there are a lot of tools that exist that uh, that make this stuff easier. Um, all right, so let's see. So you've got this XOR that zeroes out EAX. Um, you have a gadget, a gadget here that increments EAX, so it just adds one to it. Um, okay, and then you've got a gadget here that pops a couple of values off of the stack. Um, so you know, pops into EBX and then ECX. Um, Okay, so before our buffer overflow, um, these are the values of our registers. Okay, so maybe it's in a loop or something. ECX is set to a small number here. Um, all right, and our goal then um, is to, uh, to set these registers to these values, all right? So in Linux specifically, uh, what's really common is uh, You'll set um, you'll set EAX to some number that corresponds to a system call, um, and then you'll you'll put some parameters into the other registers, and then you'll trigger an int eighty instruction, uh, which throws an interrupt, which makes the kernel do a system call. Okay. Um, all right. So that could you know potentially be what what we're trying to do here, right? So we're trying to set EAX to some value. And then we're, it looks like we're trying to put in some addresses into EBX and CX. Okay, so um, so here's the stack. Okay, this is what the um, the stack looks like. Uh, here's the top of the stack, um, up in the top left, and the uh, here's the beginning of your buffer that you can overflow. All right, and what's uh, what's hex nine zero? Yeah, so that's a NOP. Um, so it, does, it doesn't do anything. So it's just like uh, um, this isn't a NOP sled because we're we don't we're not jumping to shellcode immediately afterwards. But um, but yeah, it's, it's just filling it with junk. It doesn't really matter. Um, Sometimes when we're on the forensic side, reverse engineering an exploit, you see nineties everywhere. <laughs> you see NOPs everywhere. It may just be because you're lazy. In this example, the stack is obviously not executable at this point, but not for being no good. Yeah. So. Or, uh, you know, or A's, a bunch of A's, or, you know, there are a lot of. Uh, so the moral of the story is that the knob slide on the stack is not working. So. Right. <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, so it looks like our buffer takes up all of this space, so we fill it up. Um, and we get down here to this line, um, and we've got, uh, that's the end of the local variables, and then we've got the, um, the saved stack pointer here, okay, and we go ahead and smash that as well, of course. Um, and then we have uh, a return address, okay, so this is the first return address. And then you can see that we've, um, if we go back, uh, we have the addresses here on the right of these NOP gadgets, okay? Um, so basically, we've got NOP gadget one, two, and three um, addresses, okay? And you can see those over here. We've got um, NOP gadget one, two, and three on the right side, okay? Well, it's a little hard to see the mouse on there, but okay. Um, all right, so what's going to happen when um, when it's time for this function to return. So it reaches the end, um, you know, it cleans up the stack somewhat, um, and then it returns. Okay, so the return causes it to pop EIP, so it takes this address and starts executing from there. All right, so that jumps into the executable memory here, and it's our first gadget, all right? So we zero EAX, okay? Um, and then there's another return statement, all right? So that return statement uh, causes it to pop the next one, okay, and start executing that. And we see we've got um, gadget number two here in the second spot, all right? And the third, fourth, and fifth spots, okay? So we have it four times. So 
it, it ends up incrementing EAX four times. So that, we're done with that. That was one of our goals. We wanted to set um, EAX to four. All right? Um, okay, so let's continue. So then the next one um, calls gadget three, um, and then it pops two values from the stack into these two registers, EBC and EC, uh, EBX and ECX. All right? Um, okay, so uh, now if we look here, so we've written all of this data here from the address of the buffer all the way to the end. All of this is data that we controlled, we wrote. Um, we smashed EVP, we overwrote the, um, the return address, and then we kept writing return addresses. All right? And then we've got these two values here, and these are the values that we wanted to set the registers to. Right? Um, okay. Now, because there are two pops, here's the top of the stack. Um, it gets popped off and into those registers. Great, we're done. So now maybe the next one is to, um, to have it return to some um, you know, int 80 exception or something that causes a system call to happen. All right, so does everybody understand this? So it's actually fairly straightforward um, once you see it spelled out. Um, basically, you know, you're just, you overwrite your ROP chain, okay, so this is your ROP chain. It's all of the return addresses of the gadgets that you want to use in order. Um, and you just write them starting at, um, at the saved EIP value, okay? All right, now, um, how can we make this more difficult? How can we uh, make it harder to do this? Um, take a look uh, at these values here. So um, we're having to write addresses to the stack of places to jump to. Um, so what could complicate that? Yeah, um, ASLR, good. So basically that means um, if we don't know the memory addresses of these gadgets, uh, then we can't just write that and we can't just jump directly to that. We can't return to that. Okay, now um, let's look at our process memory again. All right, so um, so the kernel space, you know, that's always there. We can't really, um, you know, we can't really use that very well. Um, and ASLR cause, essentially causes um, this the stack uh, a memory mapping segment, these all get altered and changed randomly. Okay, um, so that means that any of your libraries that you load, um, you don't know where they're going to be loaded into memory. You can't always use the same address for a certain particular gadget. Okay, now within one specific version of a library, you always know what the offset is from the beginning of the library. Um, to that gadget, but you don't necessarily know exactly where it gets loaded in memory, right? Now, um, ASLR uh, is address-based layout randomization, and it changes, it depends a little bit on what type of system you're running on. So on a, like a 32-bit Intel system, uh, there are only 16 bits of entropy, um, so that's not a whole lot. Like, that's, that's in the brute forcible range. Okay, now that's not going to be the sneakiest way um, to, uh, you know, to find that particular gadget, um, but you might be able to brute force it. Um, okay, uh, however, for on a 64-bit system, ASLR works much better. There's a lot more, um, a lot more entropy. Um, okay. Now, one key thing to note is that uh, ASLR is not necessarily enabled for all libraries. Um, now, what that means is that uh, it's, it's opt-in, basically. You have to say that your library is compatible with ASLR. Otherwise, when it gets loaded into memory, it's always going to be put at the same location. All right. Now, um, now that, that sounds good for us, um, because if we uh, know a particular gadget, 
Um, if we make a, a ROP catalog, um, which Owen talked about a little bit last week, um, basically if we go through and hunt for all of the ROP gadgets in there, um, we find all of their addresses. Uh, if ASLR is disabled for that library, they're always going to be the same. Um, and that's great. That means that they're very easy to use with ROP. Um, now, uh, there, are, there are libraries that still exist um, today that don't support ASLR. In fact, fairly recently there was one, um, uh, it was discovered that, or I mean, discovered is maybe not the right word, but it was, it, it, people started talking about it, uh, that Dropbox's, one of Dropbox's libraries um, was not ASLR enabled. So, yeah, so it was specifically, I believe, uh, like a shell extension for yeah. Dropbox, um, which meant that, um, you know, if, you know, you could say, like in Firefox or whatever window, you could say, I want to save this and I want to save it directly to Dropbox. Um, so, yeah, so it, it, Dropbox, they inject this into, like, all the running processes on your computer in Windows. Dropbox. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Um, okay. So I I believe the Dropbox has fixed yeah, this, um, but I mean. You know, this is just one. There, there are a lot of other libraries out there that aren't ASLR enabled. Um, I think, like, for a long time, <coughs> excuse me, for a long time, like Adobe Reader and a lot of those, those were pretty awful. Um, but yeah, anyway. Um, so, if we don't want to brute force, or if we're on a 64-bit system, we need some way of determining the address that libraries have gotten loaded to. Um, and the, the way that that's done is by something called an address disclosure vulnerability. So you need an additional vulnerability um, in order to, uh, to figure out where that offset is okay, for that, um, that library. So for example, if you know um, that the, uh, you know, at 800 hex bytes from the beginning of the library, there's a particular gadget that you like to use. Um, it's always going to be that distance from the start. So if you can figure out where the start is, uh, you can figure out where that gadget is. Okay. So in other words, um, finding you know some finding some address disclosure vulnerability enables you to do a little bit extra math and compute all of your gadget addresses and then you're back to you know being within able to use segment. all of them within that segment right right um, okay now uh, so let's talk about where to go from here so that basically brings you guys up to speed with everything that's that's happened in this more or less Yeah. Um, and figuring out how to more effectively find them for both defense and offense is kind of where the state of the art is going. Right. Um, now, going forward from here, um, I mean, currently, uh, you know, it's like attackers three, defenders two, right? Like the uh, um, attackers are basically able to to get around everything that we can throw at them right now. So what's next? I mean, how can we improve this situation? Um, well, there's, there's one thing that, I don't know if it was originally started by Microsoft Research or what, but Microsoft Research is doing a lot of I believe this. It was started by them. Yeah, so um, there's something called control flow integrity, um, which basically works by restricting, um, you know, your control flow. And the control flow is just like 
the order in which processes uh, in in which uh, instructions are executed. Okay, so um, they do this by various means. Like they'll have a shadow call stack. Um, so in addition to the regular stack, they'll have a second one somewhere that maybe keeps track of the functions, um, and that way you can. It's basically like making a copy of all your return addresses, and um, then you can compare when it's time to return. You can say, well, yep, still looks good. Um, or uh, you can do something um, like control access in memory regions. So say, do not allow any code to return or jump into this segment. Um, this is the middle of a function. Uh, you should never be able to enter here. Um, so stuff like that. Um, and this is still fairly academic. Um, I don't know if there's any like production stuff that's using this yet. Not that I'm aware of. I, th I think it's very much in academia right now, and not as much. Yeah. Yeah. I think there were some papers that are a little bit older than that, but um, but yeah, it's. Uh, Internet of Things and everything that is now becoming addressable by IT. These things and you know embedded Linux systems. These things aren't running with all of these mitigations. So an attacker may not be able to get onto your desktop, but they may still be able to get into your network by using these things. Yep. Sandboxing is also going to work. Yeah. So I yeah I wanted to mention that because it's something. This is something that uh, we're seeing sandboxing know, being used in production software now. So if you go out and you download, um, you know, Chromium or Chrome or whatever uh, web browser, uh, it runs inside of its own little sandbox. So um, it, even if you get an arbitrary code execution um, vulnerability in it and you're able to have it run your code um, and get around all of the exploit mitigations, if you're able to do all of that, Okay, great. Now you're still stuck in this sandbox, which is just a restricted environment that the process runs in. Um, so you may not have any access whatsoever to the file system, um, or you might not, you know, have any access to any like IPC or I don't know. Um, there are a lot of different sandboxing techniques, um, and like I think that the latest Adobe Reader uses sand a sandbox. Um, I'm pretty sure, uh, and there there are other programs. And you can also, there are, uh, there's software that will allow you to run an application in a sandbox. Um, so an example might be like, uh, you can run something in a ch root uh, in Linux. Does anybody know what a ch root is? What's everyone's background? Do you guys, are you Linux users or Windows users? Both, somewhat? Okay. <laughs> No, I won't. I won't embarrass them by making all the Windows guys raise their hands. Um, but yeah, I actually only use this Mac begrudgingly. It's a lab laptop, so um, yeah. No, I'm. I uh, I love me some Linux. But um, all right. So so yeah. So ch root. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, is there any easy way to tell if an application is running in a sandbox or not? Uh, you mean like if you exploit? Like uh, if I just go home and look. At, like, is there a way that I can yeah, so, so not that I can think of, but like without looking at the source code or, I mean, trying to it. yeah, trying to reverse it. Um, that's the problem with a lot of exploit mitigation is you don't get like this lock on your browser saying, hold this as security. <laughs> I should. You should patent that. <laughs> Trade. <laughs> That's right. No, a, a visual for, uh, you know, the security of things. There you go. Smart. There you go. It's done. None of you guys can steal it. All right. Let's do it. Okay. So, uh, but yeah, so sandboxing works pretty well. CH root, uh, just to go back to that, um, basically, uh, you can run a command called CH root in Linux that uh, chroot stands for change root, so it changes the root directory to some specified directory. So you can create a directory with, say, nothing in it and chroot to that directory, 
Um, and then in that chroot session, uh, all you can see is what's in that directory. You can't see anything outside of that directory. So you can go in there, you can drop some binaries in that you want to run, um, and their libraries, and you can execute them, uh, and they run in that little chrooted environment and don't have access to, uh, to, to the rest of your file system. Okay, so that's why, um, why that's useful. Um, okay, now uh, definitely keep in mind that um, security is really just about increasing the cost of an attack to an attacker. All right, so if you can increase the amount of time that it takes to exploit something and the money that it takes to develop an exploit for something, um, you know, that's, that's a bar that you can raise to whatever level of security that you want. Um, so basically, if you're not the low-hanging fruit, you're probably okay. People with automated tools are going to be running them against everybody. Uh, as long as you're better off than your neighbor, then um, you're probably okay from that. However, uh, you know, like APT, advanced persistent threat, or targeted attacks, uh, especially by attackers with large amounts of time and money, like a nation state, um, they can usually find some way in. All right, so um, yeah, so like uh, all this, all this NSA stuff is really, really kind of funny that it's coming to light now, but. Um, it just goes to show you that if you throw enough time and money at something, uh, you can break it. You can get in. Um, okay, so um, so like I said earlier, there are a lot of tools that exist to make this stuff easier to do. Um, and I think in your RAP assignment, you're going to be doing some um, some return-oriented programming, um, and it'll probably from what it look to me it'll probably be easy enough that you can do it by hand um, but yeah um, but there are there are tools that make this easier so um, so there one of the big ones is mona.py and this is from some are they Belgian um, the Coreland guys yeah it's from uh, a group of guys uh, called Corlan um, that Actually, did they? I can't remember if they if they were the guys that did immunity debugger. Um, but so Mona works with this immunity debugger, um, and it's basically uh, immunity allows Python scripts. Uh, oh yeah, it comes from immunity set, of yeah. course. Yeah. All right. Yes. Um, but yeah. So basically, with Mona, um, it automates like the entire process. So you just feed it a program. You tell it what input uh, is user controllable and has a buffer overflow in it, um, and then uh, I think you saw Owen demonstrate that you can, you, you know, generate a pattern, a long pattern, um, that when you feed into it, you can get some data out from the crash that tells you what offset of that is the instruction pointer. Um, the yeah, the return address on the stack. Um, so yeah, so Mona like automates all of that. It's it's like really magic. Um, it's pretty pretty cool, um, and it can automatically generate these ROP exploits for you, um, and it'll give you it spits out like a Python file that that creates a ROP chain, um, and it's pretty cool. Uh, and then there's Vivisect, which is another debugger. It's from the the Ken Shoto guys. If you guys play CTF, um, you might have heard of them. They're like an old old CTF group that have been around for a long time. Um, and yeah, Vivisect is mostly written in Python, which is really neat. Um, that makes it really easily scriptable. Um, so yeah, so it's it's possible to um, in Python code uh, to to like use the Vivisect disassembler to hunt for your own ROP gadgets, for example. Um, and then there's uh, there's a tool called Rop Gadget, uh, which is a really great tool for creating Rop catalogs. Um, so you just you take uh, some binary that you want to exploit, um, or some library that gets linked, um, and you run Rop Gadget on it, uh, and it spits out a list of all the different um, classes of Rop Gadgets. Oh, um, okay. So uh, Oh man! All right, so yeah, so then I, I know that Owen mentioned ROPC, which is a ROP compiler, 
Um, and that's, that's pretty cool too. It, basically, they specify a language that you can um, write some uh, uh, exploit code in, um, and it generates like a rock chain for you that does that. Um, so it's pretty cool. Um, okay, and then uh, I kind of just wanted you guys to think a little bit about this, and Owen said that you guys are going to talk about it um, next time or next week. Um, but basically, uh, great. So like once you've exploited something, what can you do with that? Um, all right, so like if you're in a CTF, you're probably looking to read the key file to get the key out. Um, so you can read write files, you can change user, um, sometimes you can like do a privilege escalation attack, um, phone home, like you can use netcat or whatever. Um, all right, um, and then this is more or less just for reference so that you guys, um, when you get the slides, uh, Owen has access to them, so I assume he'll make them available. Yeah, um, so, so these are some really great um, kind of war game CTF exercises um, for learning. Uh, Microcorruption uh, is like in a weird architecture, um, but it starts out very easy and gets progressively harder. Um, and then I think I IO is kind of similar. It also leader. starts out pretty easy and ends right. uh, pretty complex. Um, and then this that top link, uh, the sh Shellstorm has a big collection of um, CTF binaries that you can play with. Um, all right, so uh, any questions before we jump into the demo?